and these things are just all, they're all just games and you just got to learn the rules of the game and then learn how to win the game. In today's episode, Courtney and I sit down with Andrew Feiler, the owner and CEO of Peachy Insurance. They have grown over $32 million in premium in five years. We're going to break down the strategies, the team, what it's like managing a completely remote sales team, how they're promoting within to grow their company, what they're doing from a marketing standpoint and the changes they're currently making in today's market to make sure that they are growing profitably and setting themselves up for success over the next one, two, five, ten 10 years. With that being said, let's start the show. Hey, welcome to the Insurance Buzz. We are your hosts, Michael and Courtney Weaver. And today we have a very special guest, Andrew Feiler. Andrew, how are you doing, my man? I'm doing awesome. Thanks so much for having me, y'all. Absolutely. I am pumped about today. I don't know about you, but I'm always pumped. I'm pumped. So- I'm also pumped. <laughs> <laughs> so you're the so you're the owner CEO of Peachy Insurance. All right. So I was reading up. You've grown in five years zero to thirty two million in premiums. That's an average of six point four million in growth per year. Let's just dive into that. All right, right now. Let's dive into it. Like Let's do it. Zero to 32 million is amazing, no matter how long of a career, but five years is pretty amazing. So what has it been like? Number one, what hurdles have you had to overcome throughout the last five years? You know, um, that's a question I don't think I've been asked. And so it's one that I think requires some thought. And, you know, my first initial reaction is so many hurdles, so (laughs) many hurdles. It feels like every week, every day, there's, there's more hurdles, but... I think there's there's been a few big ones, you know, over the years. And so just to kind of go backwards to go forward is, you know, we started scratch and we started a little bit differently than a lot of agents start scratch is we started with, I think it was eight or nine salespeople on day one. And I had kind of a, a different start because I was still running another age another another agent's agency while starting scratch on my own. And so I had I had the benefit of sharing some operational resources, plus just like great mentorship over the years. And I think the biggest hurdle uh, early on was overconfidence. You know, so I started in Florida as, you know, State Farm LSA. Then I went to go work for a very large Allstate agent. And then when I opened my agency, Scratch, I went up to Georgia. And, you know, I was like, look, it's going to be plug and play. We've got this outbound call model with leads and transfers, and we're just going to run as fast as we can go and take advantage of this Scratch contract. And for the most part, we did that. But one of the biggest issues was that I didn't know what I didn't know. And so I didn't really spend a lot of time looking at RMPs or guidelines or rates. And what we quickly found out is that, yeah, we could write auto insurance super easily, but home was a totally different animal. And, and usually people going into Florida say, well, home is way worse in Florida than it is anywhere else. And you know, I would probably agree with that statement, but there was just a lot of differences. And so early on overconfidence and, and just not researching, I think the right things and I don't know if there's actually a lesson in, in that is, but maybe it's just always ask the questions. I should have reached out to some agents, I think, before I got started and said, hey, you know, what should I be thinking about? What should I be looking at? But I, I kind of had this, this mentality. I was 27, I think, at the time. I was like, I don't need their help. Like, we're going to crush them, you know? And we wrote a <laughs> lot of business, you know, and that was great, but we made a, a lot of mistakes and it was a lot more painful than it probably had to be. So that was one hurdle. Another one was just, staffing and office location in general was, you know, I'm actually really grateful that COVID forced us remote when it, when it did, we never looked back. We stayed remote. And before that, there was just so many challenges around staffing. And, you know, I put my office in like the heart of Buckhead in Atlanta and I was like, Hey, it's going to be like this sexy, cool place to work, right? Insurance isn't sexy. We're going to make it sexy. And like, we were in a WeWork and they had beer on tap and kombucha on tap and they're always playing music. And, you know, it's the staff super friendly and always talking to you like they're your friend. And and people still just didn't want to just come in. They just, you know, they're like, the commute is just brutal. And so I spent way too much money on my office. People didn't want to be there. So that was another huge hurdle. And then I think the third thing is just this idea of balancing growth and profitability. You know, early on, I was on a scratch contract. And sometimes those scratch contracts are just ridiculously rich. And and the amount of money and cash flow that follows production is just absurd. And 
the adjustment when you come off of that scratch contract onto an established contract, it can be really tough because sometimes you have to shift your focus from grow, 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 grow at any cost to how do I get profitable or how do I have some growth and some profit, you know, and then you've got these agency scorecards to hit bonuses or variable compensation or whatever it is. And so I think over the years, those were some of the big hurdles. And, and I mean, I could list a hundred more if I had, you know, enough time and space to do so, but those were some big ones. So I love that you bring up the asking of the questions. Like I should have asked more questions in the very beginning. I think it's hard to ask questions if you don't really know what you're getting into though. Um, Fair. So looking back now, if you could go back to 27 year old Andrew and say, okay, this is the question that you should ask somebody who has more experience. What questions would you say, this is what you need to be asking? I think that if I was coming into open a scratch agency today in a specific market with a specific company, you know, I think it would be very different if I was giving advice to somebody who was maybe opening an independent agency with, you know, a ton of options for markets. But I think in my case, right, let's just look at it through that frame of a scratch all state agent coming into Georgia. I probably would have gone around to a couple of the agents who are writing business and been like, hey, what are the biggest challenges you're facing right now? Because if they're having those challenges, I was probably going to have the same challenges. And one of my challenges was we were writing home insurance and then we were getting stuck with all these inspections on the back end. It was making prices change. We didn't really know how to handle it. We were getting cancellations, et cetera, et cetera. And if I would have talked to a bunch of agents who said all these challenges and that wasn't one of them, and then I started having it, that would have been an indicator to me that maybe this is a me problem. This isn't a market problem. This isn't a product problem. This isn't a price problem. This is a me problem. And I think just having that frame of reference would have really helped. And so just understanding the challenges of others. But I think we have to be careful if we do that because we can't let that create like limiting beliefs for us. If someone says, hey, the rates are no good. Well, it's easy if you're starting a business to get stressed and say, wow, like everybody says the rates aren't good. What am I getting into? Should I bail on this thing? So that's the caveat I would say is what are the challenges, but know that their challenges, you know, might not, might not affect you the same way, but if you're having a challenge that nobody else mentioned, that's probably a pretty good sign that it's you. Yeah, no, I love that. And so you talked and I love that you mentioned all those challenges. So right now, are you in a hundred percent remote setting? Yes. I mean, yes and no. So call it 97 or 98%. So all state requires us to have one staff in a building. And so we have five locations. And so those are staff, but the rest of it is fully remote. You know, we have, I think around 50 employees, give or take five, you know, I'm not really sure what exactly what it's at, but for the most part, everybody's remote. All of our producers, all of our sales producers are remote. The only people in offices manning those doors, so to speak, would be customer service people. Okay. So talk a little bit about, because I believe that a lot of agency owners have went to remote um, sales producers and service producers and service, but mainly sales producers. I would love to talk about how, what managing remote salespeople looks like to you and maybe some of the hurdles you've had to overcome and what you've learned in that arena. Yeah. So again, you know, I would say I feel very grateful and blessed almost to to have been forced remote when, when we did. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of reasons for that. But one was that I think that if we hadn't been forced remote, we probably would have never done it. And the reason I say that we probably would have never done it is because all the managers, both the sales managers, the service managers, operations, me, we all preferred in person. That's what we wanted. That's what was comfortable for us. That was pre- uh, preferable for us. You know, we wanted the staff where we could see them. You know, it's just kind of like the old school idea of that. And, and there's, I don't want to say there's anything wrong with that, but I do think that the world has changed and, and will continue to change as, you know, uh, boomers continue to retire. Gen X kind of moves into that later stage of their career. Millennials start to become a lot of the upper management and, and, and then Gen Z, of course, coming in who had a lot of their life remote and digital in all types of ways. And early on, you know, I think that the the place that we were in the world was that everyone was just so unsure about everything. We were kind of just like, look, just go remote, just do the best you can. And we're just, whatever, it's just going to be what it is. And then as we watched the news, 
you're like, oh, like, you know, it's going to be a couple months and then it's going to be a couple more months. And I just, I remember talking to somebody on my team just saying, I don't think, I don't think this is going to be over anytime soon. We need to just kind of like figure out how to recruit, hire, onboard, and train remotely. Because if we, if we're able to go back, great. But if we can't, we can't just, we can't just not do anything and wait around for it. So we, we really leaned in on that, proceeded to have a record sales year and, and then we just never went back. But I think that I'm not answering your question directly. So to answer that question a little bit more directly was early on, it was just kind of like survive, just, just survive, just keep going, do what you can. And then we started to adapt over time. And, and a couple of things became clear to me is that we needed to have an environment of high trust. And before we went remote, I, I don't believe that we had an environment of high trust. I don't think we had a, a ton of trust in our employees. I don't know that they had a ton of trust in us. And in a remote environment, that has to change. And in order to have an environment of, of high trust, you have to have very clear expectations. I, I need to be able to tell you what I expect out of you on a day-to-day -day basis, but I also need you to tell me what you need and expect out of your leaders on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we need to go ahead and execute on that. And because nobody has time to check in all day, every day. And eventually we added some technology pieces in there, you know, in, in the form of data visualization on, on, you know, Excel reports from our phones. So we created this call gap chart that basically would show every outbound call, every inbound call, and then gaps when there was no activity. And what was really important about that was we were able to see how long is, you know, in an eight hour day, what percentage of the time is somebody on the phone? And I think a lot of people look at that and they say, I want that. I want to be able to find out when my team's goofing off. And that's the wrong approach, <laughs> you know, because at the end of the day, people, people goof off in the office, they goof off at home and, and people should goof off a little bit at work because if you're working eight hours straight with no breaks, that's not healthy. And so we started having just open conversations. Hey, what's keeping you off the phone? We're not giving you a hard time. What's keeping you off the phone? And like, it's this, it's that, it's this, it's that. And so we systematically started putting in better processes or hiring help to get people to stay on the phone more, which built trust and then allowed us to come back and say, Hey, your numbers weren't where they needed to be. And we've taken all of these things off your plate. And it gets to a point where if you're the leader and you're doing your job in a remote environment and taking all of this minutia off of their plate, there kind of becomes this, this expectation that you're going to hit your numbers or you're not. And I, I've, I hesitate to use the word excuses, but there's not a lot of reasons not to hit your numbers and not say anything to us and ask for help. And so it took a while. And part of it was understanding the technology of saying, hey, can we have something that taps into our phone system so we can see how many dials they're making, how much talk time, how many quotes they've done in a day in real time. We use a, a platform called Ambition for that, but there's other ones out there as well. And then we have a, day, a couple data analysts who would take our phone records every day and visualize those numbers. And it just became part of our daily huddles. We started doing virtual huddles every morning, 15 minutes. Here's what we saw yesterday. Here's what we need to do today. Lesson for the day, go. And then we would do some midday check-ins. But really this idea of like, hey, between 9 and 1 p.m., you're on your own. I'm here to help, but I'm going to expect you to do your job. We're going to have an update on numbers at 1 o'clock. If you're not on pace, I'm going to I'm going to hit you up. So, you know, hint, hint, if you're not on pace, hit me up, tell me what's going on, tell me where you need help. And then at five o'clock, we're going to kind of wrap the day up and then do it all over. And so, you know, it took a while to build that trust, not only from them to us, but from us to them and technology certainly played a part, but that, that helped a lot. And I mean, the logistics of getting computers and all that stuff, like that was a pain, but it wasn't really that hard, you know? So I hope that answers the question. It does. I'm curious when you talk about expectations, because there's the second step of actually holding somebody to it, reviewing all of that. How often are you meeting with your salespeople, your service people, your leadership team? What does that look like? So every manager is required to do a weekly one-on-one -on -one with their people. We say it needs to be at least 30 minutes. If you have capacity for an hour, do it. And that is, one-on-one -on -one is there to build a relationship with your team. And then, and, you know, in person that's valuable in a remote environment, it's, I would call it invaluable. It's, it's, it's impossible to put a price on because in remote environment, it's, you know, I hear about this all the time. People who are very anti-remote, they say, you can't build culture. You can't train. You can't do all these things. You can't build bonds. And I think that's just, I think that's just crappy management personally. I think that's an excuse of crappy managers who either don't want to learn the skills or can't adapt and learn the skills or just 
it's their preference and they don't care what everyone else's preference is. But the one-on-one is super important. And what we always tell people is this is not, this is not a time to do training. This is not a, a time to, you know, give them a hard time about their numbers, right? You can talk about numbers a little bit, but if you want to do those things or you need to have a separate meeting for that. The one-on-one is there to build a relationship and it's there to reduce interruptions by both the manager and the employee on a week-to-week basis. And we use the manager tools format. I don't know if y'all have ever heard of manager tools. It's an amazing podcast. I don't know if they're still making new episodes, but I think they've made like a thousand episodes. I listened to it a lot when I first became a manager and they have one-on-one on ones. And it's basically this format that says we do 30 minutes or you can do an hour, right? But one third is for me, one third is for you, and one third is to talk about the future and what we're going to do in the next week. And and that's how we typically have people start the format. And then over time, it it loosens as that relationship gets stronger. And one of the things I tell people is that you've got to you've got to do that because that's how you reinforce expectations. You know, early on, you reinforce like setting expectations. It's in our it's in our offer letter. It's on their first day. We go over the comp plan. The expectations are in the comp plan. Performance plans, we have automatic PIP thresholds. There is no emotion, right? It is black and white and everybody knows that coming in. And we tell people like, we're at Will State. We could fire you, but we're not going to do that. So this is kind of the cadence of your performance and what's okay, what's kind of in danger and what's out. And then the one-on-ones reinforce those expectations. And but usually when people have accountability problems in their organization, it's it's one or two issues. One, they don't have standard one-on-ones, so the relationship's not good. So they're either like way too nice or way too hard. And, you know, when you build a good relationship, you can be hard on people because they know you've got your their back. You know, they they've got enough positive interaction with you to know that you have their best interests in mind. You know, and the other reason is they have a hiring problem, not an accountability problem. So Well, and what you just said, clarity of expectations. Clarity is key in accountability. It builds confidence within an organization. So I love love that you're going there. So I want to transition from team to strategy. So to go from zero to 32 million. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh Uh-oh, you're not ready to transition yet. What's up? What's up? Okay, so I, because I'm vibing on this so much because you're talking about one-on-ones And I think this is a step that gets missed a lot is this building rapport of checking in on, and I love how you broke it down like a third, 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 because a lot of times if there's a problem at work, it means that there's something else getting in the way. For sure. And we, we are going, if you go straight into numbers and expectations and you don't know that there's something else that's happening, you can't help pull that off the plate. So. I wanted to put a pin in that and <laughs> celebrate Andrew there for a second. But I did have a yes. question before we move on to like strategy of like how we grew, because I see this question mark come up a lot with agents on what your managers. Did you promote from within mm. or did mm. you hire externally? Because there's that line of like the debate of, do I pull this person and pull them out of production? What does the production look like for the manager? Let's talk about the manager role because they're holding people accountable now. We promote a hundred percent from within. And every time I've done it for a sales or service type manager, it's failed. I will go outside for a specialty role. Like I have a digital marketing specialist and I didn't have somebody in the organization who had those skills. So I had to go outside. If I had somebody internally, I would have promoted from within. It would have been a mistake because the guy that I, I I did end up hiring is amazing. And I'm so glad that we have him. But in terms of sales leaders, CX leaders, service leaders, um, trainers, it's always promoted from within. And and I hear you on the on the challenge of how do I pull them off production? And I think people make two mistakes when it comes to deciding whether or not to promote and who to promote. The first mistake is that question of, I'm going to give up all this production, right? And what they're doing is they're thinking about the opportunity cost, which is good, right? They're thinking about one side of the opportunity cost of taking that person off production to manage. But I would say is that they're not looking at the whole picture. Is it easier to get one person to write a hundred items or is it easier for one person to get 10 people up 10 items? And I think the latter is almost always true. And so mm-hmm. this idea of if you're going to promote somebody and, and they're a 60 or 70 item producer, can they can they get a net hundred by making everybody that much better? Okay, so I think that's the first thing to think about. And if the answer is no, well then maybe you're not ready for a manager. 
because maybe you don't have enough people to get enough lift. The second thing is that a lot of times people promote their best person, their best producer on the sales side or their best, you know, cross seller on the service side. And what we've kind of figured out, you know, and this isn't a hard and fast rule, but it's been, it's been true for us is that typically your best salesperson is not your best manager. It's usually the person who's, you know, maybe that middle upper, they're good, but usually they're kind of burned out. They're ready to get off the phone. They're just kind of tired. Like, you know, if they were their best selves, you know, two years before, they might be your top producer, but they're ready to do something different, get some growth. And you need somebody who actually wants to manage people, not just make more money. And for that reason, our sales managers typically make less than our top producers. And we do that on purpose. And we always tell people, look, when you're going to become a manager, yes, you're off the phone. You'll probably take a step back at first, and then you'll come back up over time. And that's helped us with kind of a selection problem of our top salespeople aren't going into management because they, they value money the most. And the people who are going into management are ready for something different and they want to manage and help the team. So, you know, all that being said, you know, we do promote from within because occupational knowledge is really important. The trade off on that, right, obviously is, is the production you lose, you know, but hopefully make up more so than the other pieces. It's just really hard to go from a peer to a leader. And I would just, encourage people if they're going to do that is you want to start setting that manager up for success early on, have them kind of lead informally and see how the team reacts. Do they buy in or do they resist? Because if it's done right and you promote that person, everybody should just kind of be like, yeah, of course they're the new manager. Like who else would it be? Like that's, that's what you want when you promote from within. But that also creates just a great story for everybody that you're hiring is, hey, we promote fully from within. Here are people who started as an outbound caller, who went to sales, who went to manager, who went to operations lead, et cetera. So. All right. I'm going to dive into this a little bit more then. All right. So yes. Got, see, there's so much juice here. So you, like got got five, so you have five offices. So yep. roughly, can you walk us through what your, like what the structure looks like, like what your up, upward, upper management leadership looks like, the amount of managers you have, how big the sales teams are that they're managing. Let's just, let's go that route. That's, this is good. Sure. So I will do my best to do this off the cuff. I should know this a hundred percent, but you know, I really, I have two amazing. No, you shouldn't. You should not. You're yeah, the we have CEO. two amazing people <laughs> who, who, you know, one guy runs sales, the woman runs um, operations, customer service, and basically all the people ops. And so I really trust them a lot to run the business. And they're both incredibly talented. And I've worked with them both for a really long time. And so they would know this like the backs of their hands. Uh, so I'll do my best. So uh, I'm going to kind of split it up a little bit. I've got ops, service, and sales. Sales is going to be, there's going to be four teams in sales right now. I have an outbound calling team who do nothing but make outbound calls on leads and transfer those calls live to my salespeople. I have five or six of those people at any given time, and they are expected to get around 20 live transfers per person per day. So they're pushing 100 to 120 transfers over to the sales team per day. I have there are four, five to six people on that team and a manager. That manager does they manage that outbound calling team. They also help a little bit with training and then they also will call our monoline book. So their main goal is to manage the outbound calling team, but they do a little bit of sales and they do a little bit of training. Our sales managers are a little bit different. So I've been trying to get to 24 salespeople all year. The highest I got of people actively selling was around 20 people with a couple people training. And what we try to do is we try to run one manager to eight salespeople. Anything more than that, and it gets kind of hard to do the one-on-ones, kind of do the training, the, the personal piece. Our sales managers do not sell. They are strictly there to help the sales team like remove barriers. I, they're like a bulldozer out front. Like they don't, if there's any type of weird product that's going to take a while, the sales manager will do it. If there's a really upset customer or you know, because the salesperson screwed up, we actually have the sales manager call back, fix it, and then train the person. And so we have three sales managers. And the goal is to have three teams of eight. I think right now we have 15 salespeople selling. We've had a little bit of attrition, but we have four or five people in training right now. We have a full-time sales trainer who is responsible to make the decision on every sales hire we make. He trains them for the first six to eight weeks and then does continuous training with the managers over time. Service, I have, I think, nine customer service reps a trainer and a manager. 
My service team is has production goals. So we don't ask them to actually like write home or auto insurance, but we do ask them to get, you know, call it 10 to 12 live cross sells to the sales team. They have upsell goals, you know, they have a referral goals, they have some other things. And we've changed our model quite a bit. It used to be, you know, get service people, take 25, 30 calls a day, just kind of do the thing. Now it's take 15, 17 calls, good conversations, reviews, make recommendations that will get you an upsell or an across on if it doesn't be really pleasant and ask for a referral. So that's the general uh, structure of sales and service. And then operations, I've got three data analysts. I have a digital marketing specialist. I have my business partner, CFO. Um, I've got sales leader, ser- service and people ops leader. And then I've got, I think one, I've got an HR person and then an operations person. I think I think that's everything. I might be missing somebody. Sorry if I missed you, whoever. <laughs> no, that's fan man, that is so good. I love um I love that your CSRs are in charge of getting people over to the sales team for upsell, cross sell. But my question for you is is if so you've run a team of five to six for the the cold call in for the live transfers, yeah. outbound calls. Is your turnover in that position fairly high or is there abilities to promote from that position into a sales position? What does that look like? I would say turnover, you know, I wouldn't say it's any higher than, than the sales position. Um, I would say it's high. I think it's probably 25%, you know, on a year. I do believe that that role has a shelf life of six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. I think people just kind of get a little burned out. It gets, I mean, it's just Mm -hmm. monotonous, you know, you're just doing the same thing every day. And it's not necessarily easy from an emotional standpoint. I think it's not really hard from a technical standpoint, but it is, it's, it's definitely hard from an emotional standpoint. And the act, the actual goal is to hire people who want to become a licensed agent who we think maybe is a little green or a little inexperienced and doesn't maybe have as much experience as we want. And so we'll bring them in and we'll say, Hey, do this role for, you know, five to six months, hit your targets, get your license, we'll pay for it. And then you can move into a sales or service role. And so Mm -hmm. that really is the idea. It's this idea of creating a bench. And, you know, I had a, I had a couple of callers that lasted two or three years, which I thought was incredible. And and something I I was having this conversation with somebody else who runs this model is that I actually think if you're in person, the turnover on this role, if you hire well, is actually going to be pretty low. I think that somebody who gets paid because we pay our people about 20 bucks an hour to do this job plus daily bonuses. I think in person, someone's going to stick around for maybe one to two years. I think in a remote environment though, a lot of people are, you know, how do, how do I want to say this? Um, the, the typical archetype of the person that applies for the role tends to kind of be in the age range of like 18 to 25. They're kind of looking for something that pays well enough Maybe they're living with their parents. Maybe they're living with roommates. And they're just, I think a lot of times people apply for the role because it says no experience required, the pay is good. And they really just need some time to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes they say, well, okay, this can be a career for me if I get licensed or whatever. And they say, oh, maybe I want to go into tech sales, which will help them do that. I've got a lot of connections um, of people who work in tech sales. And sometimes they just go off and do something completely different, you know? So, yeah. That would be kind of like my opinion on on the turnover of that role. But I definitely do think after six to 12 months, there should be pretty strong conversations about, hey, what's next, whether that's with us or with somebody else. And it will help either way. Okay, now we can talk about strategy. Thank you for sharing all that, Andrew. Um, because, well, hearing you break down what your organization looks like and feels like, I immediately have the marketing question of where we're at with the market that we're that we're in right now that we'll be in, I believe for the next two years, probably. Yeah, probably. What, where are you focusing your marketing, your ad spend, your dollars? Where is that? Cause I know that you have your outbound calling team. So obviously prospecting cold calling is a big part of that, but talk about what your marketing looks like aside from that. It's top of mind right now, I think for sure. And, you know, I write a newsletter that I put out every two weeks and last Friday I put my last one out and I think, it, yeah, I have a section called on my mind and, and that is literally what I talked about. And it says, you know, I asked this question, I said, when's the last time that, you know, you or any agent, the reader looked at everything that you can write and that you can get paid on. 
And I think the answer for most people is probably never. And I think I'm guilty of that certainly as well. And so as the market tightened up this year, we've been pretty lucky in Georgia, at least under, you know, the all state banner, it's been pretty hot. You know, we've had a record year for production. It's been, you know, even the ROI has been amazing. It's been both strong growth and profitable growth, which doesn't happen often, but it's starting to tighten up. We took home, home, uh, uh, underwriting guideline restrictions, then auto, then a home rate, then an auto rate all in the last 60 days. And so close rates completely tanked. You know, we're spending 40% more on marketing, writing 30% less, you have 70% swing there. So, you know, it's something that we've been thinking about a lot and had been thinking about, but now it's accelerated. And, you know, whether you're an independent agent, right? If you're an independent agent, you have a lot of options, almost too many. And I think you have a challenge of what's the right niche or what's the right focus, you know? And then I think if you're a captive agent, whether it's farmers, all state, state farm, or, or one of the more regional carriers, as I talk to more and more agents, you know, through consulting, it's, I'm finding that every company has a couple products that pay really well, that seems to be ignored by everybody. And, and for, for all state, right. Just from my own personal experience, I, I've kind of identified a couple. One is financial services, AKA securities business. You know, I think I just built, you know, my outbound calling model and said, you know, what if I was able to use the same model, but even if I could talk to three people a day and close at this rate, the ROI is really strong. I think some state farm agents have mortgages. They said that they get paid 1% of the loan amount. And I'm just like, the math on that works extremely well. Every company seems to sell Medicare and the commissions can be like 25 to 40%. And, and I think something that happens a lot is that I think, especially if we're, we're captive, you know, and, and I think in the independent world, I think it, it could be paralysis by analysis, but I think in the captive world, it's like, I think we focus so much on, you know, our, our year end bonus or scorecard or whatever, um, kind of like everybody's talking about. And if they're not talking about these high commission things, no, you might not even know they exist. And so for me, as I go into next year, I'm trying to say, how do I grow, but maybe slower, but at a higher profitable rate. And then maybe I sell some Medicare and I do some of these securities or financial services and use the same model I've done, you know, not stopping auto and home insurance, but maybe allocating a little bit differently. And so that's kind of what it's going to look like. We are definitely going to focus a lot on ROI, you know, and, and also profitable segments. And like, there's a, a conversation I had with somebody, they said, well, you know, I don't really want to, to get people who are between 60 and 80 because the close rate's about, you know, 20% less. And I said, yeah, but like what's retention on that, on that group? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, 40% higher. And so I, you know, I don't even need a, a spreadsheet in front of me to know that that's probably a winning proposition long-term. And so just kind of thinking about the flow through is it, yes, if you need cash flow right now, then you've got to focus on the highest cash flow thing right now. But as, as, as things shift, you know, I say from offense to defense, thinking about, you know, what do I want the structure of my book to look like? Do I have one revenue stream, AKA home and auto, or do I have five revenue streams? I have some home and auto. I have some life business. I have some securities business. I have Medicare. I have all these things. And you can diversify inside your business and outside your business. And I think ideally we should all be doing both of those things. Yeah. You just said two really powerful things. I want to just reiterate real fast. So I'm a huge believer that the harder the business is to get, the stickier the business is going to be. Typically, um, right? Period. Like if it's, if they are hard to attract and hard to write, they're hard for a reason because they're loyal and they're not going to mm -hmm. go anywhere. All right. The right. second thing you just said, and I don't think, I, I think it life insurance, look life and no matter what company you are, Life insurance pays really well. Your customer needs it. Your current book of business is typically a 90, 10 to 85, 15 split, meaning that a small percentage of your book of business are, only has life insurance, which means a large portion needs life insurance sure. going into the securities or whatever. So um, there is lots of opportunity out there. And in this hard market, you still got to write the PNC. You still got to be on top of your game. You still got to be mastering your craft and growing that book but you also need to be looking for the low hanging fruit and how can you dive into not only attracting new business, but into your current book to increase that retention and help them in more ways. Financial services is that answer. I, I agree completely. And I think the challenge for a lot of agents is I, I think, th I think there's numerous challenges and I think I would say my challenge is how do I do it 
with speed at scale, right? I know we can do it, but we might not be able to do it quickly or at scale. And so for me and my team, that's the conversation we're having is how do we do this and how do we create a process that we can do over and over and over again, spread across 20 to 30 producers, you know, and then really make it go because the margins might be slim. And if you're only writing a couple policies a month, well, then a slim margin isn't great. But if you're writing a bunch, then that margin really adds up. And, you know, depending on the company that you're with, the commission rate can vary or the structure of it can vary. Sometimes you have, you know, renewals or trailing commissions. Sometimes you don't. And the key is just finding a way to win. And, and, and these things are just all, they're all just games and you just got to learn the rules of the game and then learn how to win the game. <laughs> That's right. Play the game, baby. The Andrew, game. this has been great, man. This is yeah. uh, so many takeaways. I have like a whole page of I notes. Do. So um, this has been fantastic. If somebody wanted to follow you, connect with you, um, work with you, like what's the easiest way for them to connect with you? Two ways. So you can go to my website. It's www.nextcallclub.com. Just like it sounds. Uh, no weird spelling nextcallclub.com has all the stuff that I offer in terms of services through consulting. I do outbound call consulting, which uh, US based callers as a service. I do analytics. I'll do one-to-one agency consulting. And then if you just want to follow along, don't want to spend any money with me, I promise I'm not a hard pitch type of person. You know, uh, I'm most active on LinkedIn. You know, I'm not hard to find. Uh, I think it's just linkedin.com slash Andrew Filer, but there might be some nuances into that URL. Uh, and then I have a newsletter that I put out every every other Friday and right at the top of my LinkedIn profile, it'll say steal our strategies, click it. You can read the newsletters that are there or sign up. I'd love to uh, have you follow along. Yeah, man, your your LinkedIn content is fantastic. So I, uh, Thanks, I, I love being connected that. with you, brother. So um, Andrew, thank you again so much for your time. This has been great for all of those of you listening. Uh, I would love to know what your biggest takeaway is from today's episode. So make sure you text us 816-727-7610. Other than that, as always, time is the most valuable and important asset that we all Absolutely. have. We appreciate you spending time with us, Andrew. Thanks again, brother. Courtney, Michael, thanks so much.